Hello and welcome everybody, nice to have you back. Today we return to our renewed coverage of Victoria 3. Yesterday we talked about trade, tariffs and infrastructure and so on and how it was reworked. There were a bunch of mechanics that have changed and there are a bunch of mechanics that we know exist but we don't really understand the inner works of it. And this video here won't cover any of the reworked mechanics because that is of course for yesterday's video. Make sure to go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. This video will be focused on the monthly updates of June and July. Uh, I'm going to cover, of course, June first. June will be very mechanically heavy, like we're going to be talking about party mechanics, about ideology mechanics, about things that you may have never heard about because they never were in a dev diary. They weren't really in these monthly update videos either, but it got me to research and it turns out that they had been revealed in the Discord already. I can also tell you that on Thursday next week, as I understand it, that is at least uh, the way it is seen in the Discord by the devs and such, maybe, you know, things can always change, but it appears that the upcoming dev diary next week on Thursday will be on the topic of characters and how characters influence for example interest groups so that should be something to look forward to and that will then definitely go hand in hand with this video. In this video we will first for June we will be talking about a couple of June things about diplomatic plays to unify your nation for example but at length we will talk basically about parties and ideologies leaders and for example interest groups. All of that is a topic that we know existed for a long time now. We didn't see the inner works at all. We of course understand parties exist. They were implemented after people uh, complained rightfully I think about the uh, absence of them and I was worried back then that okay the devs are now saying they will be implementing parties and this might very well mean that the parties are kind of tacked on. It's just like a visual layer basically they don't really do much because ultimately it was just something done because people complained. But I gotta tell you after seeing, after looking into this, after seeing what has been talked about by the devs in the Discord, they are doing a, a damn good job, at least as far as I'm concerned. Please let me know about your opinion. As always, I'm interested to read those without a doubt. So let's just start with June. Again, very mechanically heavy. The July part of this video will mostly be about eye candy and whether I like the eye candy or not and what might be done about it. Either way, let's start with June. So I saw the screenshot and it's innocent enough because this is just France. You can see the opposition right here. It's the Bonapartist party, the Republican party and the clerical party. Obviously, they have some sort of elections because otherwise parties wouldn't form. And you can see all of these are in the opposition. Now, I wasn't too confused by the parties themselves. Armed forces, petite bourgeoisie in one party makes a lot of sense. A Bonapartist party, as I understand it, is or might be uh, just a general sort of monarchist party, right? Then we have the Republican Party, that is the torch of liberty right here, so obviously industrialist intelligentsia make, uh, makes a lot of sense there. And then the clerical party with the Catholic Church. What confused me a bit is the fact that we are in a position here. Obviously, again, they're all in the opposition, so there's no difference there. We are in the opposition. And for most of the people that are in parties, you can see that they have the symbol of the party. For the armed forces, you can see the three dots. Now, you might say the rural folk have the three dots. It might just mean they're not in a party, but the armed forces are in a party. And I said to myself, it has to mean something because otherwise they wouldn't be delivering that information to the player. And I believe that this information, that these three dots basically say they are undecided, which means they might be dropping out of that party. They might be leaving that soon because of circumstances that have emerged that are more important to them. It basically indicates to the player, hey, Whatever you're doing, whether you wanted them in the party or whether you wanted them out of the party, something has changed and something is about to change. That is my theory and how exactly people join parties and why we're going to see in a second. You can see the same thing right here. This is Will uh, William of Hanover. His heir is, of course, Victoria. Although she looks a bit older here, right? Um, anyway, this is the government of Britain. So the actual government right here. And the Christian party is in charge with the Anglican church, of course. And then we have the rural folk that is also in government, but not in a party. And you can see, I think the theory that this shows non-commitment is pretty obvious. Because again, the rural folk has these three dots without being in a party. Um, then right here, we have the United States of America. You can see the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Know Nothing Party. And you can see that the armed forces, the southern planters, the petite bourgeoisie are all in the Democratic Party, except only the southern planters appear to be committed to this party. Um, and actually, now that, I, now that I look at this, I didn't notice this before, but the Democrats actually have the fleur-de-lis here. I think this might be the generic indicator for conservatives, where it basically says this party, they're the conservatives in the current circumstance, and they're in a position where they want to maintain the status quo. And it appears that the armed forces and the petite bourgeoisie are unhappy with actually maintaining the status quo as one party, as the conservatives. And that's actually quite interesting, yeah. I, I looked at this and I thought it might mean royalists, but then again, France starts as a monarchy anyway. Um, 
The symbols, I think, ultimately, this is just a generic symbol for something. I think it means conservative to a degree. Um, because the Southern Planters, of course, they want to keep slavery enacted, for example. They want to maintain the status quo. They don't want changes in the distribution of power because ultimately they are benefiting from the status quo as is. But as you can see, again, the armed forces, they disapprove of your nation and it appears that they have lost their commitment to this party. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to go through all of this. There's a lot to be seen and there's a lot to be talked about. Um, these are some notes that Daniel Tolman basically left in the Discord and they are very, very interesting. Today we will hear about the topic of how characters and leaders influence uh, interest groups, what the purpose behind them is, how often it happens. We will learn about how interest groups choose new ideologies and how all of that then actually influences joining parties. I'm not sure, I don't think I added the joining parties to, to the screenshot because I asked that question uh, just the other day. But anyway, we're going to be talking about this. There's a lot of information here that we haven't seen, so let's do it and let's digest it fairly slowly. Sorry for the late reply, I've been wondering specifically if the armed forces have dynamic ideologies to adjust for the political climate, for example, to represent the Red Army if a sociali uh, socialist revolution succeeds. This is, of course, an excellent question. We, even now, I think, well, until right now, we don't really know that much on the topic of how people choose their ideologies, on, on how an interest group changes it. We have debated this on this channel multiple times. I remember that we talked a lot about the question of, for example, a conservative government running together with the trade unions, in which case the trade unions would be happy with a conservative government. The example that I gave was the uh, distributism, which is, of course, a Catholic doctrine of uh, basically not socialism, not capitalism, but the idea of a fair economic system under Catholic surveillance, if you will, or supervision. And if you include the trade unions there, the trade unions would be happy and there's no incentive for them to go anarchist. But my question always was, is that something that is flexible enough? Or are we looking at a situation where it might turn out, and there's a, an annoying flyer, where it might turn out that, you know, for example, even if you have the trade unions in government, even if they're happy, they aren't going to adjust. The trade unions will turn socialist as soon as you unlock the technology. Unlock the technology. We have an answer now, right here, and it's really good. A bit of a spoiler to the, for the dev diary that didn't come out last week, but which will eventually, which should be the upcoming one next week. There are lots of factors that determine the ideology of interest group leaders. Here's one for the armed forces being extremely likely to adopt vanguardism under a council republic. Right, so the leaders are very, very likely to adopt something that then directly corresponds to where your state and where your society and where your interest group is at. Let's take a look at this, because if you've ever modded any of these games, if you uh, are a developer, then you will recognize this code as something that is very, very... Um, changeable. This is something that is insanely flexible. So what are we looking at here if you can't read the code? We are looking at something where it asks, okay, do we have the Law Council Republic? And if we have it, look for the interest group arms forces and check whether they have positive approval. This is what, what these lines mean, okay? And if they have positive approval, so if they approve of this society in a, a Council Republic, add a 1000 chance for them to turn towards vanguardism. So vanguardism being one of the socialist slash communist doctrines or ideologies, I should say. This means that this is fundamentally the core, uh, or I should say the code, that can also be used to, for example, check for traits, check for decision, check for uh, events. If, if you've ever modded CK3, for example, this is basic run-of-the-mill code that can be altered in infinite variations that can have infinite more checks. You could literally do a check that's, uh, that says, do we have... Um, <laughs> do we have a surplus of chairs? Because if we do have a surplus of chairs, I would like to add a chance that the trade unions can turn into fascists. Okay? You can actually do that. It, it, it's ridiculous. It's insane. Sure. But the fact here is that eventu eventualities are something this system can account for. An IG leader comes in and then checks, okay, I'm a new IG leader. What situation are we in here as an interest group? This means the trade unions... Okay, that are in a position where they, for example, are in government, where they are cooperating with a the church, they should be less likely to actually, or well, they can be coded to be less likely, I don't know whether the devs are doing that, but those trade unions should be less likely, if not maybe impossible, to actually pick up, for example, full separation of state and church. It would move us to an interest group leader that might even be devout, right? And these are things that vanilla should and can be able to deal with and account for, but that can always be influenced in a, an insane way 
by modders. I, I love to bring it up. Just think of Sunless Seas. Uh, Sunless Sea is a mod, of course, that is being discussed. The modders are, after all these months, and, and I commend them for this because, of course, this gives me a lot of trust in the actual process and the project. But um, the modders are still talking about it. And the modders can do stuff such as, I don't know. The interest groups, who are they working with? What is going on with the Great Khan? Is the Great Khan expa uh, expanding here or there? Are we looking for the surface? Because if we are looking for the surface, this could unlock a trade that, you know, makes, for example, the trade unions in this case, or, well, whoever would be the trade unions in that mod, uh, could make them more militaristic, right? These sort of things and this uh, flexibility that this system allows for the ideologies of IG group leaders and maybe even IGs, so interest groups themselves, is excellent. This is really, really good. So... What we know now, just from this post, is that they choose their ideologies based on the genuine circumstances of what is happening. Let's continue. Um, right, so they need to be loyal, they need to be uh, with the Council Republic, and then the armed forces might stop being your enemy that try to, you know, basically safeguard the old system, and you might have a communist armed forces, basically, uh, leadership. Right, next question. Is there any way to cycle IG leaders so that you can ditch your dinosaur monarchist armed forces IG leader for someone with more modern sensibilities? Up until recently, interest group leaders were sticking around for much too long. I recently implemented some script that makes IG leaders cycle every 10 years on average. So this is not every 10 years cutoff point, it's just the average. This means your leader ideologies will more consistently reflect what's relevant to your country. Very, very cool. So again, interest groups in themselves are of course archetypes. They're, they're basically the stereotypical idea of what is this interest group in society. The leaders sort of uh, reflect back. Right? What society has done, where it has developed, whether interest groups are happy, whether they're doing well, uh, what exactly is going on. And they will be day current, so they, they will update based on current events roughly every 10 years. If not, you know, depending on assassinations and such, more frequently. Oh, that's actually really cool. So the player finds the armed forces a really convenient power base and maybe decides they don't actually need the rule folk anymore. <clears throat> or maybe the intelligentsia. What happens? This can certainly happen. Though the armed forces are not very likely to adopt any kind of leftist position before council republics are adopted, several interest groups are drawn towards more radical socialism when they are angry outside of a council republic. Let's just let's just see this again. I, the example that I gave with, uh, with uh, the trade unions. If your trade union is very unhappy, they will turn to anarchism, they will to extremism, they, they will look at a situation where they just want to get rid of the society. If your trade unions aren't government, if they're doing well, if their pops are happy, you know, they might not do any of that. So you can, in that game, run with the trade unions, run in a compromise arrangement with the church together as well, and it could be viable because this code is that flexible. Really, really neat. Um, Several IGs are drawn towards more radical socialism when they are angry outside of the Council Republic, but what the armed forces are angry in this case, they're more likely to be drawn to the far right. Right, because that is where they are placed roughly, uh, you know, unless you are in a communist uh, uh, society, a communist dictatorship. Uh, what changes uh, to make them leftist when you swap to Council Republic? I guess the leadership is purged and new officers who are loyal are promoted up. Right, so basically what takes place, and obviously, yes, this effect simulates the idea that as you turn around in your new army, in your new organization, you are going to have a strong military leadership. The Soviet Union had a strong military leadership, of course, still very much at the beckoning of, for example, Stalin. But we're looking at a situation where Stalin saw himself also, you know, to a degree as just the be-all, end-all of everything anyway. That's just totalitarianism. But the idea is that, of course, the armed forces in the Soviet Union weren't fundamentally conservative folks, uh, you know, aristocrats and so on. So we're looking at a situation where they can naturally react. And you will see it right here. Here's one of the factors for deciding if an IG leader sh uh, should be a radical. A, a radical, I believe, in this case, uh, means uh, being very libertarian. More likely, if issues are relevant and people are angry. So... Does the owner have any of these laws? National Guard, secret police, outlaw descent, autocracy, oligarchy. So if you are an autocracy, you're looking at this where it's possible that an IG might become a radical if there's also turmoil. So you're an IG, you know, everything is fine, but... Well, <laughs> everything is fine. Uh, things are troublesome, and the reason for the trouble may be the fact that people are being spied on. You have a higher chance of turning radical. Now, if people aren't unhappy, if there is no turmoil, and if these laws are in place, people won't turn to radicalism, or at the very least, with much less of a chance. These are these changes that I was talking about. It's incredible to me that it works this way. It's very, very neat. Uh, definitely just reacts to the 
current circumstances. Overall, I try to script ideologies so that they appear when their issues are relevant. For instance, there's no need for abolitionists to appear in a country with no slaves or serfs. And some of the more radical, small r, so just radical, ideologies should be much more common when pops are angry, but uh, and less when they are con uh, content. So for example, happy trade unions outside of the Council Republic will be more likely to be social democrats than anarchists. Boom. I think that the depiction of contemporary ideologies making it into your interest groups is really well depicted here. Now, how does this all come together with parties? Um, I read this and I asked, okay, Daniel, uh, that's really neat. How does it work with parties though? How do I decide, do I join a party? Is it based on, for example, my pops are unhappy, right? Um, the pops of the interest groups X have lost certain amounts of wealth. This means they might join a party that is just anti-establishment. I asked whether that is how it works, so fairly uh, short term there. And the answer I got was no, that's not how it works. There are two main reasons why an interest group, let's just go back here, why an interest group would join a party. For example, um, and I think, I don't have the screenshot here, that's fine. Oh no, actually, I, I, the screenshot will come up in the July part, don't worry about it too much, so it doesn't really matter. The point is, I will join a party in particular to go through with a specific legal arrangement. For example, if I want to go and say, I have an ideology that makes it so I would like to pass a law that, you know, makes us more autocratic. I want a dictatorship, basically. I will band together with somebody else around this. What these three dots mean, what these three dots mean there, what they mean here if you are not on a party, it means that you might be slightly drawn to a party, but currently you are undecided. But if somebody emerged with a party that you can agree with, for example, let's say the rural folk, you know, they're very unhappy, they want restrictions to migration because, I don't know, their wealth went down and they have an ide ideology of xenophobia, that rural folk might try a party or might try to start up a party with that. And if, let's say, the petite, uh, petite bourgeoisie agrees, they will join together in that party, in particular, to reach a different legal circumstance. If you will, interest groups joining parties on the first level is very, very similar to movements, except it is institutionalized. Movements occur on the streets, right? Sometimes people want to preserve laws, they want to change them and so on. That is where movements appear. And these movements are very temporary, they're based primarily on people being extremely unhappy. But the idea of movements is that it pushes something through in an uh, outside of parliament. This is where it happens in parliament. You say, I want this arrangement, and then you see, oh, they just founded a party to do this, and now they're get going to be elected together. This could be dangerous. The second thing that Daniel explained, um, uh, based on which, of course, you know, uh, interest groups decide whether they join a party is ideology per se. So, for example, let's say, okay, I don't really care about any of these laws this party stands for. However, my ideology is just, in general, I don't know, could be xenophobic, could be conservative. And if you are in an ideology that fits a party roughly, you might be joining that party there as well. So these are the main factors. The laws that people want to change, that is what, band, what they band together around when it comes to parties. And then the ideology as a fallback option, that is at least how Daniel explained it in the Discord. Ultimately, bringing us into the following situation. Interest groups will consistently choose different ideologies based with their leaders, right? That are based on the reality of the situation. Obviously, there's always some tweaking there. I gotta tell you, they will... I'm, I'm sure and I, I didn't see any of the code other than... Uh, this one. But I guarantee you there will be oversights. It will be like, oh, look, my armed forces turned funky. You know, that sort of stuff. It will happen. That's just how these work. But these are much, much more easily to adapt and to change because this is just run-of-the-mill code in the sense that it can be altered very easily. Things can be added, be it conditions, be it effects, be it changes, be it how often it checks, be it where it comes from, and so on and so forth. This is a very good solution to change ideologies. And let's say you have a party, and let's say, you know what, we can actually che check this out. Let's say you are in the United States of America, right? Let's say the armed forces, the Southern planters and the petite bourgeoisie join this democratic party, the conservative party, and you as the player say, I don't want them in government, I want somebody else in government, and for that, I need the armed forces out, for example. If you make the armed forces happy, they might very well say, you know what, I'm turning away. If you have them in government and you act against the interests of the armed forces, they may still leave this party. There are real-time and real-term uh, real actions that you can take that changes your society and will then either create or destroy parties. If you want to go hardcore against, you know, uh, or hardcore into the direction of, for example, socialism or, for example, fascism or monarchism, you just need to look at your interest groups, say, okay, wait a minute, how do I radicalize 
trade unions. You radicalize them by not quite marginalizing them, but by definitely stepping on their throats, by making sure that they don't think and that they have no choice but thinking that they can't actually achieve anything in the existing system. They need to overthrow the government. That is how you do it. Then they will pick up the radical ideology, then they will pick up the radical parties, and then once you actually had the revolution, the council republics are instituted, the armed forces will respond to that in kind and say, you know what, we are vanguards now, this is vanguardism, it's fine. This is very, very neat. Um, I, I thought about parties quite some time because obviously, again, I was worried initially that this might end up being one of those things where it's just like tacked on, it doesn't really do anything. But this is a great solution because you don't, you never actually go discourage the armed forces from being in this party. You discourage them by actively acting in or against their interests, which then either, if it's a, a party that wants to do something, you know, that, uh, uh, or wants to preserve something, will then either keep them in or push them out depending on what you wanted. This is really, really neat. Um, I think this indirect approach where you change society and then society changes the interest groups is exactly what the game needed. And of course, you uh, you know, just as a reminder, um, for example, the Democratic Party, um, when they go to elections, again, uh, you can't move them into government one by one. You have to pick the entire uh, Democratic Party. And if one of the interest groups in that party during an election has good momentum because they're performing well, they're on the on the up and uh, uh, over. You know, if, if they're doing very well, then they will also pull the others up. You could theoretically have something here where, let's say the armed forces, let's say elections happen, the Democratic Party, you know, the uh, Southern planters, they're doing really well. So they strengthen the election outcome for the armed forces and the petite bourgeoisie. And then you manage to pull out the armed forces and the petite bourgeoisie from this party, making them accessible to form a government without the southern planters, which you wanted out. And the percentage that they actually have to offer was heavily, heavily influenced by the fact that the southern planters were present and pulled them up in the election because they had good momentum. There's a lot of engineering that you can do here. I am very, very excited about that. And I'm very excited for the upcoming dev diary. But as I said, we already sort of are moving further ahead with that. We had a bunch of information there that is super, super cool. Um, I would really love to see this in action. I can't wait for the streams that will happen eventually. This was the mechanically heavy uh, part here, basically. We now know how interest groups get different ideologies, what is influenced by it, and just how quickly accessible this code is. And we also know when they choose to join or leave a party based on laws, based on legal changes they want to make, and then, of course, also based on ideology second in there. You can absolutely attempt to have a, distrib a distributism-based society where trade unions do not turn anarchist because they're happy, they their pops are doing well, and so on and so forth. You could have a requirement where you ask the question, does, for example, Kyoto produce fish, and if so, make the armed forces of France more likely to become this or that? You could do that. Would it be nonsensical? Yes, but I'm saying this flexibility makes me very, very happy. I was worried. I remember bringing it up several times in the past, just like a broken record. I was worried that they would take an approach where interest groups are fairly hardwired. This is not the case. This is the least hardwired case that is possible. Uh, let's move on beyond this. Um, I just wanted to address this. Basically, we are coming back now to a different topic. This is not parties. This is still June. Um, but this is the question of assimilation. And I saw some takes and some opinions where it was basically saying it's kind of weird that to assimilate, somebody needs to be accepted. Uh, so basically the way it works, and let's just read this out here. Since the peasants, Hungarian Protestant, is of an accepted culture, live in an incorporated state and do not consider Antiqua a homeland, they are assimilated into the North Indian culture, as it is the most prominent primary culture where they live. Minimum assimilation of 10. So people were, were saying, it usually only makes sense, or it would make sense by thinking about this, that you would only assimilate if you really had to. So if you're already accepted, why would you assimilate? But I think that is sort of... Um, grand strategy thinking. It's sort of PDS thinking. If we, because all of the games do it this way, if uh, if you're suppressed, then there's a high chance that you will change, you know, be it via pressing a button, be it via, for example, in CK3, um, if I don't allow a different culture to exist in my realm, then they will be changed. That is how these games usually approach it, but Victoria 3 does it in a much more realistic way. Let me tell you, if you are part of a culture that is not seen as a primary culture, even today, you can't actually assimilate because you're not accepted. People will see what your original culture is and they will say, nah, that's not how it works. There's both a willingness from the side to actually assimilate and the other side where the side has to say, you can assimilate. I would much more, you know, basically look at this and say, only accepted cultures can assimilate into the primary culture because the way to assimilate isn't actually open for anybody that isn't an accepted culture. In, for example, the United States of America in 
uh, the, the early 19th century, there would be no way of a Native American to fully and properly assimilate, ex except maybe on like a minuscule level when it comes to st uh, statistics, because they simply were not seen in the same light as, I don't know, a British person migrating. Uh, any European migrating, I know that there of course was uh, discrimination there as well, but it's not the same degree, right? So ultimately the idea that you have to be accepted to assimilate, I find it very, very nice. I actually wanted to just reiterate that because this is one of the points that Victoria 3 does very differently and I think is actually like the best approach that any grand strategy game has taken so far. Now the next topic is about nation formation. Um, this is the basic nation formation, of course. This is just Poland. You click the button, hey, uh, I have the potential to form Poland because my primary culture is Polish, so I can do it, right? And then here you have the requirements. For this screenshot, I just want to say, I really hope that they work on the interface. The fact that there's no, like, uh, frames here, the, the fact that the uh, flags are just there, but that is neither here nor there. What I really want to talk about it, there's, uh, is that the way nation formation works, nation unification works, is that for a simple nation uh, formation, so there are, there are major ones and simple ones, this is a simple one where you just press a button to become Poland once you satisfy the requirements. Um, I think the way this works is fine, right? It basically is just a decision. It, it says, hey, if you control this, you can press this button, you get a different title. And that works. Where I see a lot of trouble, and let's just go to this screenshot right here, and, and first of all, I, I really do need to, I, I don't, I really hope that they work through this interface. I, I think the flag is just present like this. It, it's disordered. You can't like filter. You can't reorder it. It's not corresponding to the map, right? There's so much here that I hope that they address. But again, this is also a fairly old screenshot. It's from the July video. But where I'm coming from here is that I want to renew, after thinking about it, after taking a break on this topic, I want to renew the criticism that I brought up when we looked at these nation formation dev diary uh, uh, for the first time. I want to renew that criticism because I think it still stands. The way the leadership play here would work, right, is you basically do a leadership play where you go against Austria. That leadership play, if you win, makes it so that Austria is then kicked from having the opportunity to be a leader. And once the leader candidate is only you, you can launch a unification play. Launching the unification play, however, is something that I am not really in favor of the way it is. What I, what I mean here is... Um, because this system is clearly modeled, I think, on the Italian and the, the German unifications. And in Italy, of course, you had the different poles, you know, I mean, you had Austria uh, in there no matter what, but you also had uh, the different poles, you know, when it comes to uh, Sardinia, Piedmont and, and, and two Sicilies. And then in Germany, you had Prussia and Austria. The leadership play itself is totally fine and totally cool with me because it puts us in a position where you have them pitted against one another and whoever wins will come out on top and be good. They will be, have the opportunity to launch the unification play. What I do not like at all about the unification play is that fundamentally in its core, it basically pits you against anybody that isn't your active supporter. And when you look at the German unification, you had the Brothers War in 1866. That Brothers War was... Uh, between Prussia, its supporters, Austria, its supporters. Russia won. In game terms, that means Austria is no longer a unification candidate, it's only Prussia, and they can launch a unification play. Prussia's unification play was against nobody. <laughs> Russia's unification play was against France. Not any of these. All of the southern nations, including Bavaria, that were not yet a part of the North German Federation, supported Prussia in that sense. I think what I am missing, in a way, I think, is um, even if you, let's say, I don't know, this always, you, the, the unification play is always launched against some internal enemy that realistically didn't really exist. Um, I wish it would be viable to have everybody here on your side, you click this button, unification play, and that is when outside powers have a chance of standing up against you. It's not really the same as when Prussia forced France into a war by insulting uh, uh, Napoleon III. It's not exactly the same, but it has the same result where then all of Germany together, rather than Prussia fights Bavaria and France because France came into the Diplo play, where Germany together fights against France. This big three hurrahs for Germany moment isn't actually in here, in this system, because the unification play as a core idea launches against whichever of these nations is not yet for Prussia. So what I'm saying is, um, even if you have everybody on your side, I think this is something where it should be changed so that you still have to launch the unification play 
and it works like a Diplo play. It's a Diplo annexation and other people can get involved. So to put this into the historical context, this would mean in 1870, Russia would basically have everybody roughly on their side as rough supporters. And then you press this button, a diplomatic play for annexation of everybody starts and outside factions, Austria, and maybe Austria not because they were defeated, but definitely Russia, um, Great Britain and France, they all can get involved then. But the way it works right now, again, if you if, let's say Austria wasn't here, the way it would work is that you press this button and all of these that don't have the Prussian flag here would move against you. I, I, don't, I don't like that system because fundamentally the unification play should be something that can pit you against other smaller nations of your overall nation if they are not supporting you. But I think fundamentally it should more pit you against the concert of nations, against the people that are the powers that be, because obviously that was the big topic of a unified Germany. The German question was a question of if we let them unify, doesn't that make them too dangerous? Doesn't that create a situation where they are too powerful and the balance is completely thrown out the window? That isn't really re uh, represented here. Obviously the result will still come in. If France supports, you know, the resistance to the unification play, then yeah, it can be done. You can stop it. But I think this unification play fundamentally should essentially be something where as great powers, as the concert of powers, you can say, I'm stepping in here. Um, that is my criticism. I, I personally, I just think that there's some uh, overlook here. I also did see, or some stuff is overlooked. I also did see this, of course. And this is a culture map. So let's just ignore Poland, Poland, Lithuania. Pretty neat. Um, what I would rather like to point out is that this is a culture map, but it's not the culture culture map. This appears to be the map of who holds the most power in the politics of the location. So, for example, this right here is South German. Obviously, in majority, it's actually Czech. This is obviously, in majority, Hungarian. It's just that in this location, German, South German pops hold the most political power. I really hope that we will have a map mode of just a culture distribution. But yeah, this is, this is not it. This is not really a criticism, just something I noticed here. Who knows whether we have that map mode? Who knows whether we don't have it? This brings us to the end of the video for June. We will now move to July. I just want to point out again, the leadership play, I think the unification play should be reconsidered, at least in my opinion. I, I think that the unification play, basically this being against some German nations and this being some German nations is not really representative of things. Um, but again, that also depends on like how it actually goes, whether you can get people to just agree with you. And the other thing was, of course, the big topic of parties. I mean, there was so much that we learned here about parties and ideologies. Let me know what you think about that. Let's move on to July. So, July, as I said, is generally just a uh, lot more eye candy, a lot of discussion there. I just like looking at pretty stuff, and uh, there is some stuff here, of course, especially when it comes to battles, but I think that is not a new topic that I just want to remind you of, that because it was a big, uh, you know, basically conversation before the break in Dev Diaries. Um, this right here, the first couple of events that we will see, uh, I just like looking at the events, I think that is pretty neat. I also would like to, of course, take note of the art, in particular for this one, the Upper Egypt Flood, event in Upper Egypt. The local river banks have burst in Upper Egypt, destroying homes and taking lives. The banks had been swelling for days, but we didn't expect the deluge last night. We weren't prepared. The state will have to figure it out on their own, or we should put some more money into relief. Um, pretty run-of-the-mill, I think, disaster event. Something bad happens, you need to react to it. Perfectly fine, right? Um, I have to tell you, obviously, this isn't appropriate for uh, Upper Egypt. Completely wrong style of... Uh, uh, of the architecture, for example, but this is something that we have to expect. The limitation of how many assets you can create for how many cultural, religious, and so on circles is limited. Um, you can see this, for example, with CK3. It brings the question up in my mind, of course, could we see something like, uh, you know, uh, flavor packs like CK3 does it? Remember that uh, the old games, they all did it in a way where they would have these unit packs, they would all be very separate, they would all be sold individually, and you would have 50 million of them. I don't think that is coming from us, but I do think uh, we will be seeing flavor packs that, you know, of course, add both event, but also just uh, uh, art flavor for certain regions of the world. Think of Fate of Iberia, think of... Uh, for example, the Northern Lords for CK3. I think those is that we're going to as those are what we're going to be seeing. I would be surprised, quite frankly, if we saw a radically different DLC model for this game compared to CK3, where CK3 says we have these flavor packs and then we have major expansions that will come out, uh, you know, in in uh, alternating fashion or at the very least, uh, you know, alternating fashion is difficult because sometimes, you know, <laughs> COVID, uh, some things happen that change the direction of development but i think that general system is something that will be kept here and it will be needed of course because flavor packs i mean 
You can see it right here again, it's art that clearly isn't meant for Egypt, but there is no Egyptian art because there's just so much that would have to be done. I assume that will be solved via flavor packs. Uh, let's take a look at this. A renewed Japan event in Kanto. A reformed army, an open and recognized country, a new society. The Japanese shogunate stands as an equal among the powers of the world and will perhaps begin to pursue imperial ambitions of her own. Um, so this clearly is a restoration and it appears that the Japanese shogunate is still the shogunate rather than the uh, Japanese empire, meaning that the shogun still holds power rather than what happened historically. By the blessing of heaven, we sit upon the sacred throne on which our ancestors reigned from time immemorial. The civilization and institutions of Japan are so different from those of other countries that we cannot expect to reach the declared end at once. It is our purpose to select from the various institutions prevailing among enlightened nations such as, such as are best suited to our present conditions and adapt them in gradual reforms and improvements of our policy and customs so as to be upon quality with them. Um, we will cover a Japan AAR. Maybe tomorrow. We will cover that and we will take a look at how Japan can do what's happening here. The Japanese Empire shall rise, we will uh, need powerful friends, for we shall make powerful enemies, or railways are the key to our future. So this sounds like you're going on your own, this sounds diplomacy, and this sounds economy. Who knows what it gives you, maybe some uh, bonuses, but yeah, pretty neat event. I like this, and obviously you can see there is adequate art here as well. Signs of the Times, event in Eastern Thrace. A woman has started a protest in the center of Constantinople, stating that her children have nothing to eat but rats. People have gathered around her, joining her desperate pleas. I hope you never have to look at your children's face when you serve them a carbonized rat and tell them it's just pork. Die to them to the, uh, so their innocence is preserved for a bit more time. Just one more day. Forbidding them to play hide and seek so they don't get hungrier by the effort. Telling them that if they move, the boogeyman will, uh, will find and catch them. Right, uh, that's a disaster. It's a very interesting event. I want to point this out, not just because of the art point. Obviously, um, this is, I believe, meant to be Paris. Wasn't that the, the loading screen, what that was meant to be? Either way, uh, clearly not Eastern Thrace, right? But again, that is a topic that we already have talked about with the flavor packs. What I want to point out is that um, they're doing a very smart thing, and I think Victoria 3 has been incredibly active about this. Uh, second, I think, to only CK3, but CK3, you know, especially when it comes to map design and making you think about the visuals of the map while engaging with mechanics, CK3 is very lackluster. But what we can see right here, especially with this piece of art, is that commonly, as a player, you might be inclined to say, oh, wait a minute, spend more money? That's ridiculous. I'm not going to spend money. These people are poor. They really attempt here, and they do this for all of Victoria 3, but it's it's a unique thing, I think, for PDS. There's a lot more focus um, on the visual connection to mechanics here than in other games. It's a unique thing that they have such a strong emotional appeal, both in the visuals, but also in the text. Um, commonly would be, oh, the situation is tough. It's very, very personal here. It's so much more personal with these quotes, and they really cared about doing that. And I think it's something that one should keep track of, because uh, when you play other grand strategy games, most really don't do that. They just present a choice to you, and it's a mechanical, it's a purely mechanical choice. Stellaris is very mechanical, very dry about this. They very rarely talk about the plight of a situation. Purging somebody is very easy, because it's just you changing a couple of numbers around, right? And when you play other Grand Strategy games, be that from Paradox or not, I would really encourage you to check whether they engage with the mechanics and the visuals and the personal storytelling the way they do here, because it's a unique thing for Paradox to do it, but I also think it's a unique thing for Grand Strategy as a whole. Grand Strategy is very lackluster when it comes to subconscious influence taken over the player. The player commonly just looks at the numbers, knows exactly what to do. They have a much more emotional appear, uh, appeal right here. They had it here as well, of course. It was just the complete destruction that you see in front of your eyes. I really want to point that out because I think that as we now come to the, uh, to the screenshots that go past this, for example, right here, right? You can see that on the map as well. They really care about giving you a visual impression that touches you emotional emotionally, that then influences your choice of mechanics, rather than just say, okay, hey, look, this city is here because you built it. No, no, no. The city is meant to reflect whether you're treating your people well or not, and that is meant to influence your choice. It's a very, uh, again, a very unique thing. Not many games do this. Uh, let's move on to the Sick Man of Europe event in Eastern Thrace. The Ottoman Empire is in a period of steady decline. If we do not reassert Ottoman sovereignty and reclaim our place among the powers of the world, we risk catastrophe. We have fallen, but we can rise again. In an auspicious incident, we deposed the Janissaries, who had maintained their miserly grip on power for centuries, finally allowing reform to be possible. Um, an auspicious incident is actually the name of basically the fall of the Janissaries. That's what it's called in, in Turkish. There's much more to do. First, of course, we need to replace the Janissaries with a truly modern military force. But in addition, we must restore the, uh, the place of the sublime port as the very height of civilization. Education, urbanization, and sovereignty shall be the top items of the Ottoman agenda. Great reform is needed. Uh, again, fairly generic, I think, uh, 
image right here. That is something I think that follows through these images in general because obviously that is a big time investment. Now this one is much more interesting, not just um, a visual candy thing. This one shows information that is known, that hasn't been discussed in Dev Diaries, but that is a fairly big change. In previous iterations, the market price of a good would be as low as 50% of the mar of, of the goods base price and as high as 150%. So if the price is 100%, 150 is the max and 50% uh, is the minimum. You can see it right here. This one is actually plus 75%. This is plus 71. We don't have a negative one here, but basically the way it works is they now change the limits from plus 50 and minus 50 to plus 75 and minus 75. I have also seen that... Uh, one of the devs pointed out that there may be a game rule in the future that lets you completely remove the limit, but the limits are still here for balancing, of course. So that is something to keep an eye out for. That is quite interesting indeed. I wonder how it influences the market and what made it possible for them to give more flexibility to the market price. The criticism of just plus 50 and minus 50% is, of course, that it maxes out very early on and might save people from utter collapse if... You know, uh, that would have meant utter collapse had it gone further down or further up. Um, so getting rid of the cap or moving the cap at the very least by another 25% in both directions adds a lot more flexibility to how the market can behave. Now here we have politics. Um, this is where I just wanted to point out, uh, I meant that earlier in the June part of this, that here you can see the Conservative Party, which is why I'm saying they are probably just Conservatives with the Fleur de Lis. You can see that the armed forces over here, they have the Conservative icon, but they're not in the party. I believe that after, I'm actually not sure, it's possible that after the next elections they will join or that they will join should you be moving the armed forces to the, uh, should you basically reform your government, they will be changing position. Either way, you can see it right here, they are leaning towards the conservative party and all of these are still very much undecided. Uh, so that's pretty neat. I, I think um, the way parties, the way interest group ideologies work, that it was a super cool explanation that they've given and I really like that feature. Yet again, reinforced here by how the armed forces have picked it. They like the, the state, they like the society, they have a plus seven opinion. Obviously, they want to join the Conservative Party, they want to maintain the status quo. Very, very cool stuff. Um, nothing else that we really should care about from the screenshot. There's one question that I had, because you're looking at this, and it feels to me as though this implies that if, if there's only one party, they will get the full boost of percentages from an election but people would still vote for these technically speaking even if it wasn't in parties it would just be independent ca uh, candidates that are part of these individual interest groups i'm not sure whether this works as designed but also might just be an interface thing i don't want to spend too much time on that i don't think that is too important now here comes the big visual candy um gotta tell you i really like what they've done with that map we have talked about the expansion of buildings i I, I've been playing now in ck3 i've been playing for a while with the mod that adds the buildings that are appropriate for the holdings, uh, sorry, for the um, buildings that you have in your holdings on the map. It's so much nicer. CK3 needs to step up its game, especially when we compare this to this. Just look at the size of Constantinople and you can zoom in and then we'll actually see everything going on there. This also is actually, again, CK3. I, I, I just gotta, I give CK3 a lot of praise because I really like what most of the designs are in that game. But I gotta tell you, um, Come on, making the table much more medieval would be so neat. It's so basic, right? But seeing this, it really does look nice. These are some nice uh, 3D depictions. Now, here we have the, the critical part, I think, when it comes to the eye candy. Um, the battles are depicted in this way, where it shows the most militarily advanced battalion in the battle on each side. Um, so, first of all, you got the, fo uh, the wall of fire here. Still not the biggest fan. And then we have this. I was genuinely hoping that when a battle happens, since I don't need to, oh, I need to click this unit, I need to click that unit, I don't need to click that unit, since I don't need to be exact with where I click, I was hoping they would basically just put a lot of eye candy down. In the later stages, uh, trenches that run here, then a tiny trench here as well, maybe some trenches there, some trenches there, maybe some like little pips, not even people, just little pips walking over here, over there. Uh, the explanation given was that basically... Um, if I recall this correctly, the explanation given was that uh, they wanted to do something other than little men walking around, which, fair enough, right? I just feel like it's very, very static, especially in a warfare system, again, where you don't need the exactness of you clicking. Since it is macro-based rather than micro-based, um, you could have so much visual fluff here, and it wouldn't actually harm anything, because the only thing that is 
worthwhile clicking is this exact pointer right here. Um, I think this looks fine, but I don't love it, basically, right? It's, that, that's my personal opinion on this. I, I think that... Uh, I also do think, while, while I do hold that opinion, I do kind of feel like, in my mind, since Warfare is so focused, this is a complaint that to a degree is overblown. I gotta be honest with you, if you really think about it, how often do you watch the battle animation in any of the games that you play? How often do you not just click somewhere to initiate it and then maybe look at the uh, at the battle report, for example, you know, be it the active battle or the post-battle report, but then you go do other things. The visual fidelity of battles, especially battles where you don't need to micro, ultimately really doesn't matter that much. Uh, I kind of feel like it might be a restriction of performance in the sense that I am using in CK3, I don't know whether, you know, if you're watching the series then you will know this, I'm using a custom map mod that I made that basically makes the map, as you zoom in, makes the colors of the map transparent earlier than that happens in the game. It phases in the 3D objects earlier than that happens in vanilla. And I know that many people can't run that because they just don't have that good a computer. And I didn't really change anything. I just made things come in earlier, but the added 3D objects could definitely slow people down that have a worse computer. And this might be one of those cases as well, but then again, you can just argue, okay, you could tone down a... If you have huge visual fluff, you could tone that down in the settings. I don't know why they couldn't do that in Royal Code. You can literally, instead of a moving camera, instead of animated characters, you can have it all be still. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of this, but I also think that we might be overblowing this by a wide, wide margin. Um, because how often are you really going to look at them? Uh, let's move on from that and let's take a look at this here. Just as I said, uh, you know, when I when we were looking at this, I was pointing out how when we actually look at these cities, it, it, it just it makes CK3 feel really bad. It makes many other games feel really bad. Imperator Rome, of course, had holding sprawl as well, but Imperator Rome fo uh, followed the old model that CK2 also used, where sprawl just meant putting random houses down. What they do here is they don't put random houses down. You have three levels of the quality of houses, for example, whether you have a rich city, whether you have a poor city, and then you see the actual buildings in this location. So, for example, the uh, uh, garrison, you have, for example, the Hagia Sophia, you have the city marketplace right here. There is so much detail in here that is just way cool. And in a way, I gotta tell you, I would rather they have the fidelity of these systems here in the cities because that is my society than in the battles. Doesn't really invalidate my personal criticism of the battles, in my opinion, but it's certainly one of those things. I will spend much more time looking at my cities than I will spend time looking at battles. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, right here we can see this effect as well. This is Paris. This is the city um, administration. This right here are the barracks. Then right here we have, I believe this is the government administration, uh, which we learned now will be in different cities to encourage that you can actually tax those people. Very excited. And you can see different levels of wealth here. I said this ages ago. I really wish, as much as I think this is nice, you know, like this looks really cool. This is much, much better than any of the previous games. It's not even really a, a, really a comparison. But when I look at this, for example, right, we have a situation here where uh, these, this is the same exact building model, right? I would really like it that if you have the same level of wealth in a location, that these two would become a unique block, for example. Oh, this is the same level of wealth? Well, then these three become this block. Ultimately, these blocks would also repeat, but they would repeat less often as they fill a bigger space and can be more unique in that city. Uh, maybe we're going to see that eventually for now. This is the way it looks, and it still looks so much better than uh, what any other game by Paradox has done. Now here, I want you to keep an eye on this exact building, because that is the building that is actually changing. It is changing the wealth level, and with the wealth level, you see the animation of the anvil being hit by the hammer. Uh, not sure that I love the anvil animation. I don't really think it matters too much either. Uh, so yeah, not really a complaint. I just like that it actually visually changes this much. This really will be a living city, but that's not a secret. That is what we knew from that big, big Europe shot that we saw ages ago. That, that was really, really neat. And of course, here we have the street travel as well. Here we have Devastation, and this is one of those things. The Devastation is so nice, visually speaking. I really was hoping that the exact visual fluff, because ultimately, this is just visual fluff, right? But I was really hoping that this exact level of visual fluff would be applied for battles. Um, you have this in the cities, you have this in the countryside, you have the burning, you have the changing of the trees, whether there are trees in this location. It's so, so well done. You know, but ultimately, actually, it, it really makes me think, I think it's a, it might be a conscious decision to have the battles be fairly simplistic because they don't matter that much, and the devastation that battles leave behind matters much more for your society because it changes where people migrate, whether they're happy, whether they're rich, whether they're losing wealth, and so on. 
Whereas battles themselves really aren't that important. This is an indicator that matters for your society much, much more than a battle indicator. Yeah, um, it's a difficult topic. I wish we were this fluff heavy on every single visual aspect, but yeah, it's, it's a choice that was uh, made right there. Then right here, we can see something that I also wish every other game would do. Um, you see this right here, this is a timber camp, so they log things. And as you proceed to have higher levels of timber camp, more and more trees will be gone. Really cool. Um, I, I wish that this sort of urbanization could also happen in CK3. I mean, in CK3, look, for example, in 867, look at East Francia, and you will have a territory that is incredibly, incredibly uh, forested. There, there's so, so many trees in that location. But then as you proceed, as you uh, start creating an empire there, as, you, as development starts to go up, I really wish, like, tiny little villages would be placed and then more roads would be created. Victoria 3 does it. CK3, I pray, might do it at some point as well. And then here, this is the last one. This is just road travel. Um, gotta tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm very simple on this topic. Looks very good. <laughs> I still love the way the roads look. I love the road travel. I love the, the railroads. I think visually speaking, outside of the battles, Victoria 3 is an absolute monster. Right. Uh, this was the overview for June and July. You may have realized a lot of very, very heavy mechanical stuff, but also just some nice eye candy stuff. Let me know what you think about all of these things. I will be back tomorrow with an AAR, probably with a Japan one. Let's check it out. For now, I will see you later, alligator.